Sparging involves rinsing the grains of residual sugar once the mash is complete, and you had best be sure that you use water precisely heated to 170 Fahrenheit or 77 Celsius to perform the sparge step. Too hot, and you'll extract tannins. Too cold, and you'll reduce extraction. But does the temperature of your sparge water really create perceptibly different beers? Well, to find out, we're looking at two experiments, one comparing standard sparge temperature water to boiling water, and the other using room temperature water. Can participants tell the difference? This episode is sponsored by Yakima Valley Hops. More on them in a bit. The all-important mash is where the starches and grains get converted into fermentable sugars. Oftentimes, the mash is performed with a portion of the brewing liquor, and then the leftover of that is used to sparge, which generally involves rinsing the grains to extract more fermentables. Brewlosophy contributor Will Lovell recently conducted an experiment on sparge water temperature, and he's here to tell the tale. Hi, I'm Will Lovell. I'm a contributor with Brewlosophy.com. But like me, Will has an all-in-one electric brewing system that can perform full volume, no sparge mashes. So why on earth is he sparging in the first place? Way back in the day, I used to have systems that used a cooler, and sparging was quite the common thing to do. Um, I never quite got into fly sparging. I was more of a batch sparge guy back in the day. Uh, but sparging can come in handy with these electric all-in-one systems whenever you're going to, you know, maybe do a little bit more volume than your system can handle. So sparging definitely helps add some water to the end of that. It also probably helps get a little bit more extract out than maybe doing a uh, just a no sparge kind of method. Now, it's commonly recommended to sparge with water that's 170 Fahrenheit or 77C. And that's because cooler water can lead to lower efficiency and warmer water that risks unpleasant tannins been extracted. Now, Will's experiment was designed to evaluate the differences between a Kolsch sparge with water at that proper 170 Fahrenheit temperature and one sparge with boiling water. And this was a first for Will. I've never been quite brave enough to use boiling water as sparge water. I think I've gotten up to 190F and didn't really notice any effects, but that was all kind of anecdotal. So what would happen if we push this to the extreme? Because if we go with what convention says, um, I should have made the most astringent mess this side ever. But, you know, there there are some things going for home brewers, like we don't have as much kind of uh, volume size. And so we don't get as much heat retention in there as you might expect, because we're dissipating a lot of that heat off in these kind of smaller systems. So I really just want to put it to the test and see if all these fears that I had were founded or if it was just another wives tale. And why Kolsch? Um, I went with the Kolsch. It's a lighter style. I had the ingredients for it on hand. Um, and really, I picked this recipe. It's a fairly simple recipe. I just wanted to do something very simple. Um, to me, Kolsch is kind of less about grains and more about letting that um, that yeast shine. And even though probably, uh, you know, there's some other yeast out there that would have been okay, Kaiser yeast is a perfectly reasonable selection for a Kolsch yeast. And so I just really wanted to keep it super simple. And I wanted to make sure that if there was going to be a difference, uh, let's keep the recipe so simple that we can let that variable shine. So we'll start in Brunei by adding identical volumes of RO water to separate kettles. And while the water was heating up, set about milling his grains. Now, how did Will split the water between the mash and the sparge? What I actually did is I tried to simulate kind of an old school cooler system. And so I literally took, um, you know, a little over half of my total volume of water and I used that in my initial mash. The total water volume was 7.75 gallons or 29 liters. Will mashed with 3.75 gallons and then kept four gallons for the sparge water. So I mashed that volume of water for 60 minutes. Then after that 60 minutes was up, I actually drained off through the, the valve on my um, Delta all-in-one into a bucket. And my first runnings actually went into a bucket, kind of like you would do with the old cooler system way back in the day. And then after that was done, I took, uh, in this case, either my boiling hot water or my 170 degree water. And I um, put it into my all-in-one, stirred it up really well and let it sit for about 15 minutes. At that point, I didn't drain it into the bucket necessarily. I just kind of pulled up the malt basket and let it kind of drain out from there and then went about my merry way. So at this point, the variable has been introduced. One batch has been sparged with four gallons of boiling water and the other batch has four gallons of water at 170 Fahrenheit for the sparge. And after adding hops during the boil, there was a measurable difference between the two batches. The 170 Fahrenheit sparge water batch had an OG of 1052, that's 12.8 bricks, 
and the boiling sparge water was at 10.53. So the slight difference in sparge water gravity, I think um, this is kind of what I experienced back in the day when I would do 180 versus like 150, 160 degree um, sparge water temps is usually that warm water gives you just a, a little bit more um, extraction, a little bit more efficiency. Obviously uh, the common wisdom says, are you gonna extract some other things with that extra bit of efficiency? Well, I guess we're about to find out. When the beer had finished fermenting, that one point brevity difference remained, 1.008 versus 1.009 FG for the boiled sparge water. Three weeks later, the beers looking visually much the same, were ready for evaluation. Participants were served one sample of the beer made with 170 Fahrenheit sparge water, and two samples of the beer made with boiling sparge water in different colored cups, and then asked to identify the unique sample. First up to take the triangle test was the brewer himself, who attempted five semi-blind tests. So my impressions from the triangle test, I went in and I was just 80, 90% certain that I could tell these two beers apart. I'd been kind of trying them side by side, and in my head, one was more stringent than the other. And then I go in, and the almighty triangle test proves me a fool yet again. It's just putting aside all that bias, putting it all on the line, and then only being able to identify the odd beer out just two times kind of tells you that these beers were a lot more similar than they were different. In fact, they were so similar that they were basically the same beer. But what about the 24 blinded participants that took the triangle test? Well, 13 tasters would have had to accurately identify the unique sample in order to reach statistical significance, a total low of only seven did, indicating participants were unable to reliably distinguish a difference. So much for the tannin bomb. At the end of the day, we would have expected um, that we would have extracted so many tannins that these things, one would just be this tannin, you know, kind of a stringent mess, and the other one would, would taste nice and clean like you would expect a Kolsch to be. And we just didn't reach that significance. Um, I was as surprised as anyone else on this, and you know, if we had to gas chromatograph or had some kind of you know testing instrutation, we could have made an objective difference. Um, but you know, perceptually, there was no difference, and you know, and that kind of lines up because a lot of people do decoction where you literally boil grains in your mash and you add it back, and so that kind of lines up with those experiences. And so I'm kind of glad to see that my data lines up with that, and that we can, you know, if we let our sparge water temperature go just a little hot. You know, we don't have to freak out about it. Now, before we get to our second experiment, a quick word about today's sponsor, Yakima Valley Hops. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world. I'm using Yakima Valley Hops in every batch I brew. Carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic and many more. Homebrewers can select specific crop years, and most hops come in 2, 8, and 16 ounce packages. I personally love using the 8 ounce bags, which gives me plenty of hops for a brew day, and I can store any leftovers in my freezer for use in future brews. Head over to yakimavalleycops.com to see everything they have to offer. Okay, so sparging with boiling water didn't result in detectable tannins in Will's Kolsch. But what about the other end of the spectrum? Sparging becomes a little easier if you don't have to heat the sparge water at all and just use room temperature water instead. I asked Will if that's something he's tried. So I have done this and while I haven't done any triangle tests or blind experiments with it, I, I have actually used um, you know room temperature, tap temperature water uh, to sparge before. Um, you know, in general, you'd expect just a little less extraction, uh, maybe not a ton, but you know, I, I've done it before, I've had success with it. The biggest bummer about it all though, is it takes forever to get to a boil because now you've knocked down this like 150, 160 degree work all the way down. You're adding this like, you know, really 70 degree, sometimes in Texas, 80 degree water to that. And now it's gonna take you probably twice as long to get to a boil. And that's actually the real bummer of it. But in a pinch, I don't have any problems doing it. Former Brewlosophy contributor Ray Found put this to the test. He designed an experiment to brew two American amber ales, where one was sparged with cool water and the other standard sparge water temperature. Ray mashed both batches at 146 Fahrenheit or 63C before preparing his sparge water. One batch was room temperature and the second batch was close to the standard sparge temp of 170F. Ray performed a brief voloff at the conclusion of the mash, then collected the first runnings before adding the sparge water. 
The standard temperature grain bread was now at 155 Fahrenheit or 68C, but the cold water had dropped that grain bed all the way down to 93 Fahrenheit or 34C. Based upon taking gravity readings, the cool sparge water was a little lower than the hot sparge water. Once fermentation was complete, the beers were packaged and ready to present to tasters. Participants received two samples of the standard sparge beer and one sample of the cool sparge beer, then asked to select the unique sample. A total of 17 people participated, and at least 10 participants would have had to make the accurate selection for statistical significance, but only seven were able to do so. To Ray, both batches tasted exactly the same, a nice dry, toasty character, and noticeably hoppy. Sounds delicious. So while in theory, cold sparging reduces the risk of tanning extraction, and while it did have a small but measurable difference in gravity, in this instance, cold sparging worked out just fine. So I asked Will that given these two experiments, does he plan to change how he sparges? If I was going to sparge, I'll tell you what I currently do with my process. I literally, I take the full volume of water and I put it up to whatever my strike temp is going to be, which is usually about 160, 161. And then what I actually do is I drain off that 160 degree water into a bucket, the amount of sparge water I'm going to need. And then basically I'm not doing really hot or really cold. What I'm, what I'm doing is whatever the temperature that bucket of water is at the end of my uh, mash. Yeah, it's sure. It's not 170. Sure. It's not, you know, 200, but it, it is going to be warmer than say running it off the tap. This is just kind of an easy way for me to streamline my process. So I kind of do something in between. Well, how about you? Are you sparging? And if so, have you settled on a preferred water temperature? Let me know in the comments. Thank you, Will, for sharing your thoughts. And if you'd like to hear about some of the other things Will has been up to, may I highly recommend checking out how one brewing mistake taught him a lesson the hard way. You can watch that here.